Cut Print and Bloody Bloody Bible Camp are both about serial killers, but they could not be as opposite from each other. <laughs> Is that a good thing? I think so, because you know, Bloody Bloody Bible Camp is very much in line with the stuff that I've done, and you know, um, I was very moved when Vito Tribuco and Reggie Bannister asked me to participate, because I felt like these guys get exactly the kind of, you know, we, we must have grown up watching the same movies, because that, that broad, comedic, you know, splatstick uh, is just, you know, was on every page of Vito's script, and just the fact that the killer was a, uh, a transvestite killer nun, you know, I <laughs> was like, that is, I must admit I never saw that before, and then when he added the devil mask, I just was like, you know, this is really, really actually creepy, and it could be fun, and then with cut print, I was intrigued by being asked to participate in cut print, because, you know, my, my tastes tend not to go into the uh, very extreme, sadistic, uh, you know, the, the, what, what people often refer to as torture porn. I, 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 I'm not into long scenes of torture and that kind of stuff. And yet, when I watched Cut Print, uh, the, the, the initial cut that they had, I was fascinated by by the killer and by the um, the style of the film, and it was very dark. And it was it was it was definitely you know there's there's no you know splat stick in this one. This is dead on reality, and the fact that the actor who had played the serial killer, whose name is the Maestro, the fact that he had tragically and horribly committed suicide while they were filming, and that's why the film was on the shelf. Um, it just it haunted me, and in a weird way, I, I felt that this man's work needed to be seen. Yeah, you know, this was his final performance, and it, it was something else. I mean, it's you know, and I felt let me try my hand at, at something that is polar opposite from maniacs and were bears and even Sister Mary Chopper. So it was, it's very interesting to me. These two films are coming out at the very same time because they really are yin and yang. So, Cut Print is is much more of a serious horror film. It's it's dead serious. Um, it's 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 you know, and it's one. It's a again, it's a film that is was utilized the technique of the uh, sort of documentary style, and that these two filmmakers are you know trying doing a documentary on serial killers and they're they put an ad out asking for you know people to send in their videos and they, they think it's they don't expect anything they you know it's 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 a, it's a whole sort of you know meditation on what people will do to achieve fame and success and how people become numb and desensitized to you know violence when they could go on youtube and see you know real taliban beheadings or see you know uh, the corpse of gaddafi lying on the ground you know it's, it's become so numb to that and that does eventually have consequences you know that stuff will come and bite you on the ass and what i really like about this, this film that i was that you have these two cocky film guys who remind me so much of the you know the slick Hollywood types that you know <laughs> annoy the shit out of me. <laughs> so it was kind of fun to see this whole journey turn on them, where they they, they mess with the wrong person and they, they really do catch a very serious and real serial killer, and he is sending them you know basically snuff films and. What I loved about it was it made you know we got this stuff. You know, at first they go to the cops, the cops don't believe them, so then they kind of become accessories because they they're they're getting these. He keeps this guy keeps sending them snuff films, and they you know are planning on putting this in their documentary and getting this great fame. And uh, you know, it doesn't work out too good. For <laughs> I can imagine. No, it sounds really interesting. I mean, I, I've. I always like these kind of 
And it sounds like a very timely film. You know, you go into, you know, people, how much people will sort of, you know, pay for fame uh, these days, you know, all these reality TV shows and everything. And uh, I think it's always interesting to see how sort of reality influences filmmakers. Well, you know, and it was interesting because when I first was brought on board the film, uh, uh, again, what had happened was uh, Nathaniel Knows, who's a, a very good young director in Detroit, and now he's in L.A., he had done this film, and, 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 uh, and then the actor tragically, you know, that was very bizarre, the life imitating art imitating life imitating art, you know, just <laughs> that going on and on. Mm. They, they had a very good first cut, but there was so much missing because they could you know, it's almost like that River Phoenix film that just has, has been put back together that he was filming when he died. Yeah. And I and it was sitting on a shelf for two years. And and, and uh, the, you know Jordan Levine, who was in Field of Screams, is also a producer. He knew the uh, Daniel knows, and he brought the film to me, and I watched it. And I thought, this, there's 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 definitely missing holes here. But if we can find a way to fill those holes, I think we got something really cool. And what struck me most about the film was the character of the maestro. So we didn't have Randy, uh, Randy Goodwin, uh, uh, Godwin, G-O-D-W-I-N was the guy who played the maestro. But what we decided to do was have a whole bunch of, you know, since the whole film was shot, it shot like, you know, a documentary, uh, uh, these people are filming this, we thought, well, the maestro really wants to be a filmmaker. And he doesn't see himself as a killer. He sees himself as a filmmaker, and these deaths are his, you know, his works of art. So, how would that? How would somebody become a person like that? And we came up with the idea. Me and uh, I brought on Adam Robitel, who and Gavin Heffernan, who had been with me on Chillerama. And you know, basically, we we came up with the. We we decided to sort of take the film apart and then put it back together in a, in a different order and add some new pieces, some new puzzle pieces. And those puzzle pieces were the backstory of the maestro. And we thought, if this was a, a kid who had these, you know, overbearing, over, you know, parents, the idea that maybe somebody in their, you know, had children later in life in their 40s and, and they just filmed everything he did with a Super 8 camera and the kid couldn't even take a bath or take, you know, anything, sleep, eat, without being constantly on camera by these twisted stage parents gone to the extreme. And, you know, after a while, you know, when the camera's always on you, and, and, and then, you know, his hatred towards them, it's, you could see somebody turning the camera on society and, and, and lashing out at society and filming his vengeance. So we, we, we filmed a whole bunch of these scenes and we got this amazing kid uh, uh, to play the maestro in the flashbacks. And then it just worked. It really it, it really works. And we also felt that, that there wasn't an ending. So using some, some magic of CGI and, and being able to do some body doubles with the maestro, we were able to film a... Uh, uh, an ending that hopefully will be oh my god you know jaw dropping oh my god you know yeah uh, it needed a real exclamation point at the end and uh, we brought on Vinny Guastini who actually had done the uh, uh, makeup effects for uh, Driftwood and he works now like with Darren Bousman and all that and he just did some amazing work so you know it's a disturbing film it, 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 it leaves you feeling very you know like a, a sucker punch whereas bloody bloody bible camp you're just like holy crap did i just watch that you know <laughs> you know i need another beer <laughs> i need another joint <laughs> and then with with all the the uh, catholic scandals going on the, the character of sister mary chopper actually doesn't seem that far removed from reality i don't think writer-director of the Bloody Bloody Bobby. He and I are both recovering Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> and the irony of it is we were talking about how when we were kids, so much of the things that scared us weren't Dracula and Frankenstein. It was, you know, anything that had to do with, you know, the exorcism. I mean, you go to church and they're telling you how you're all going to hell. And, and, and it was, you know, one of the scariest things it was, for me was when I was a kid and I was in Catholic school and I, uh, I had to go through the church when it was empty and it was dark and you would just see the figure of Christ impaled on the cross and I must admit you know I know what it represents and it's you know sacrifice for another 
there, and it's a beautiful metaphor. But the actual statue of a naked man impaled on a cross <laughs> with a crown of thrones is a very frightening image. And I had more nightmares growing up about that than I ever did about any hunchback of Notre Dame or Phantom of an Opera. Yeah. And, you know, and it's so interesting to me that whenever something bad happens, like Columbine or the horrible, dark, you know, killing at the Dark Knight screening, people are always blaming you know, a video game or a, a, a rock and roll song or a horror movie, and there might be truth in that, but nobody ever looks at the fact of what religion, uh, and specifically Catholicism, can do on some kid. You know, when you're constantly told that, you you know, you're, if you don't do this, you're going to hell, if you, you, you know, you don't, you, you love this person, you're going to hell, and if you have, if you, if you, you know, uh, you know, give into your hormones before you're married, you're going to hell, and if you have, a, you know, a baby before you're married, you're going to hell, and there's just so many things that just are just natural explorations for teenagers, and to be told that that's all evil and bad, and you're going to hell, and then you just think of yourself in hell on a cross. I mean, trust me, that leads to movies like Bloody Bloody Bloody. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good point. I mean, um, you know, so many movies are just blamed on all these, you know, tragic events. But then you look at, you know, these wars that are going on, and it's, you know, it's pretty much all down to to religion and it, you know, religious extremism and indoctrin indoctrination. Um, it's all down to, you know what these things people believe in and things that you know they should or shouldn't do according to you know scriptures and books and things like that absolutely so we have fun with it and and i also have to say just for the record i really want to state: don't misunderstand me people there's i'm a spiritual person and, and i believe in my version of god or you know uh, however the higher power I'm talking about organized religion. I'm not talking about spirituality. I'm talking about organized religion. There's a big difference. So Cut Print and uh, Bloody Bloody Bible Camp are the first two features from your um, Tim Sullivan Presents producing venture. But of course you, yeah. made, you made the Stephen King short, uh, One for the Road, with Paul Ward um, as your first sort of, uh, venture in that. Did you consciously make a short as a means to kind of get your feet wet with, with the whole Tim Sullivan Presents thing? Or was it, you know, just the kind of story just spoke to you? Uh, that, 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 um, I, it was funny. We were trying to do the, every, it, it just, it happened first, but it was always on the, the agenda. Um, you know, one of the things that's very important to me is loyalty. And I've been very blessed with some very, talented people have lent their time and talent to my films. And Paul Ward, who uh, is a friend of mine from Dublin, he actually flew out to be a, a, a associate producer on Where Bears and to actually act in it. And he's a, a damn good director on his own, so I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to show him my gratitude and produce something for him, just like I wanted to help out Vito and I wanted to help out Daniel Knows. I really, so many people have helped me out in my career, you know, Gene Simmons, John Landis, Ray Manzarek of the Doors, and I just feel it is so important if you're in a position to help somebody get, you know, make a movie and get their vision up there, do it. And, you know, so... It just so happened that Paul got the rights to the Stephen King short, and it, we were just ready to go. And you know, Reggie was there, and it was just, it was just, it just, you know, it just happened first. But um, in retrospect, it really was a good way to get the team together for the first time, and you know, sort of uh, test test out the formula. And it worked really well. So with the with the features, you're going the self distribution route. Um, for, for the benefit of um, readers, why did you decide to, to go down that road and what do you hope to achieve? Well, you know, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, I mean, I, this, this uh, uh, you know, November 1st marks the ninth anniversary of the first day of filming of 2001 Maniac. And it is amazing how the market and the indie horror and just the film landscape has changed in a mere nine years and you know where i might have gotten a million and a half or two thousand one maniacs now 
the market dictates that you make the same type of film for maybe $250,000. I kid you not. Um, and that it, it's amazing to me today that 250000 is actually considered a high budget for an indie horror film. Seriously, they are, you know, in order for it to make a profit because of the, you know, there's just, there's, there's no exhibition, there's, there's really no theaters to show these films, there's no drive-ins, there's no grindhouses, now there's no blockbusters, I mean, pretty much we got VOD, but you do the math, if somebody pays $10 a month to have access to every movie they want on Netflix, how much do you think any filmmaker is really going to get? Yeah. A couple pennies, if even? <laughs> so, and then the distributors, uh, you know, so the bottom line is, you know, you're being asked to make movies for $50,000, and the good news is, you can actually, you can. I mean, you know, you're not going to get something like, oh, excuse me, the Avengers and IMAX 3D or Skyfall, but you can get some quirky, cool alternative programming thanks to the the, the lack of um, the cameras are cheap. Editing is, you know, you can do that on your computer and you can do the sound design and people can create music and there's openings film school students and fans who are talented and are willing to help out for experience. So you can get some good movies done. But then what happens is, so you make something for a low, you know, I learned this on Chillerama. I mean, we made that movie. I mean, I'm not kidding you. Like, you know, Chillerama was made for probably what Michael Bay's, you know, uh, limo service on any one of his films would be. And, and even with that low, low price, because we went, you know, through a, a, an actual distributor, all the expenses, I mean, you know, the, you go to their office and they got a giant office with, you know, 150 people of overhead that they have to pay. And, you know, every single thing they bill you for, you know, that they have a, a lunch to discuss it, you know, that's a couple hundred bucks. They knock off the, pro- the profits. So by the time, you know, they're paying you back, paying you what the movie made, but then they deduct this and they deduct that, and they had to pay this for that, and then you know this for that. You're left with nothing. And you know we realize it's it's it, I'm, I'm I'm you know and it's 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 you know you go to a convention and you you know you sell a copy of a signed copy of a, of your movie for you know thirty forty dollars. The fans are happy because they get to meet you, they get a photograph, they get a personal copy, they get you know. Uh, and we, the filmmakers, make more money than we do from the distributor. I may, if I'm lucky, get a couple of pennies for every Chillerama sold. And, you know, but if we sell it ourselves, we, we get it all. And it's not a matter of greed. It's a matter of survival. Mm. Because, you know, this is our jobs. And, you know, when all you're getting is a couple of pennies for, for a movie that took a year and a half of your life to make and promote, it just isn't worth it. So you either become, you know, a teacher at a film school or <laughs> a librarian or, you know, you, work, you, you become a waiter or you find a way to make the movies at a low budget and then you sell them directly to your fan base off of Facebook, off a website, off a web store. And what I find is, you know, the fans actually are prefer that. I mean, quite frankly, if, in 1980, if I had the choice between, you know, going to Tower Records and, and buying American Werewolf in London and knowing that John Landis isn't, isn't making, you know, is only making a buck, or if I could actually have bought American Werewolf in London from John Landis, personally signed to me, along with a picture of him signing it, limited numbered edition, you know, for, for you know, 10 or 20 bucks more than what Tower Records would spend, or Amazon now in these days. Fuck yeah, I would have done that. I mean, I would have gladly bought Halloween from John Carpenter and Nightmare on Elm Street from Les Craven, you know? <laughs> and, and now, social media has completely lowered the wall between the audience and the filmmaker. And, and, it, and, and it's really, you know, voting with your purchase. If you want to see movies that are very unique you know, and, and, you know, like VHS and Theater Bazaar and, and, and you know, Hatchet and, and, you know, these kind of really cool movies. Honestly, the only way you're going to ever keep these movies alive is if you support with your dollar 
and, and you know, get them directly from the filmmaker. And, and you know, of course, there's the, the regular, the non-fan will be content just, you know, getting it downloaded for a buck on Netflix. But the real fan wants that hard copy with the nice booklet and the, you know, the, the nice packaging and the bells and all the extras that you can't get anywhere else and an autograph. So I really, this really is becoming the, the future for indie filmmaking. Um, I tested the waters with my uncut deluxe remix remastered version of Wear Bears. Um, unfortunately, by the time my mix and color correction got to the distributor, it, it, something went wrong. It was like, you know, you're running and running and running with this torch. You spend a, a year and a half getting your movie perfect, and then you pass the torch off to the distributor, and somehow in the mastering, you know, they, they drop the torch. It lives like that forever for the for the for the everybody, and it was it was not the mix that I wanted, and it was not the color correction that I wanted. So I was finally able to fix that and present the film with the eight minutes that I always wanted to be in there, and and offer it to the fans. And you know, it's a it, it's been a great success. And director of Bloody Bloody Bible Camp, you know, Tobiko, we decided to do the same thing with Bloody Bloody Bible Camp. And, and that's been a big success. And, and, and now, you know, the uh, uh, cut print is going to be distributed the same way. So how do you think independent filmmakers who perhaps don't have, you know, a fan base or if they're just starting out, how, you know, what, what advice would you have for them if they don't have, you know, if they're not established uh, in terms of self-distribution? Yeah, that's a very good point. You know, I am blessed in that, you know, I've been able to build a fan base. And what I would say about that is, Build your, make it go hand in hand. As you build your fan base, you know, you, you got you get a get a um, you know get out there on put it out there on Facebook. Get a website going for your film. Take ads out, you know, banner ads out on you know um, in, in Fangoria and Rue Morgue and Horror Hound and, and hit the uh, you know Dread Central and uh, Shock Till You Drop and Ain't It Cool News. And, and just get it out there and Twitter it. And, and, I, and, and the thing is, you know, it will happen because I see that all the time. I discover films all the time that way. I mean, I, 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 the last issue of Rue Morgue had the people. I see people doing it. They're making their own films and they're, make, they're selling it. And these things look cool. And, um, you know, I, I bought films like that. I, I can't, I bought I, some of the, the best horror movies of this year were never in theaters and never at, at, at Redbox. I have, I have seen some of the most creative stuff. Maybe they're not the most technically proficient at times, but the themes and, 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 and what they're trying to do, I would rather see these kind of films than go see The Apparition or The Possession or, you know, they're all the same movie. You know? <laughs> I've seen them before, yeah. you know? Do you think it'll be a kind of worthwhile um, investment, so to speak, if you know an independent filmmaker would you know go out to to try and get distribution deals as a as a means to get their name out there, you know, with the intention of eventually you know self distributing? Do you think that'll be something you know worthwhile? In- yes. What I would suggest, and I still will do that for the right, you know, I mean, if they make me the right deal, but it's amazing nowadays, most distributors, they, they, they won't give you anything. What they'll say is, oh, we'll put it out there for you, and we'll pay for the marketing, you know, and, and, and the only value, and, and, and there is some value to that, but what I say to any independent filmmaker is, in your contract, this is, this is key, in your contract with your distributor, Make sure that you are allowed to buy unlimited copies of your movie at cost. So, for instance, um, you know when you you know when you see Robert England or when you say see any actor at a convention sell, selling copies of his movie, hopefully they were able to buy those copies from the studio, you know, at cost. Let's say anywhere between four and five dollars. So the thing is. What you can do is you can have a distributor get the movie out there in the Targets and the Walmarts and whatever the hell is left, <laughs> Redbox, <laughs> and then you can offer what's called an enhanced version, meaning you could take you know that DVD or Blu-ray and then you can autograph it or include you know an, an eight by ten or something to make it enhanced, which then you can sell directly to a, an audience. 
audience, and that's where you're going to make the money, because trust me, you will never see a dime from a distributor. Every single movie I've made, Maniacs, Field of Screams, Driftwood, Hood of Horror, and Chillerama, I, have, I am sad to say I have never gotten one penny in back-end profit participation from any of those studios. Not a cent. The only, I, whatever I, and, and, and with Chillerama, me and Adam and Brian and Joe, I'm sorry, me and Adam and Adam and Joe, we made Chillerama for, for no money. We didn't take a director or writer or acting salary. We were doing it for the back end. Well, unfortunately, there never was a back end. So the only way the four of us will ever see money from what our creation and efforts of, on Chillerama are to sell copies of the film ourselves. But you know what? That's fine because you can do well. Yeah. So it's a, it's a cold, sobering fact. So either, here's the thing, if you're going to be working for a studio, you know, if you are lucky enough to have a film, a studio or distributor fund your movie, make sure you get a nice upfront salary or something, because that's all you're ever going to see. Secondly, make sure that you can get copies for $5 that you then sell for $25. And it adds up. You know, you sell, you sell a thousand copies at $40, you know. That's worth the year you spent making that movie, or the year and a half you spent making that movie. But it's a whole new ball game, and I know that filmmakers are hesitant to talk about this, but I think it's very important because it's it's the reality of the new market. You know, for every uh, you know guy who got lucky, for every person who got to you know every director who. You know, had a, a director. I'm sorry. For every guy who got lucky enough to direct the possession, and hopefully make some good money off of that, there's thousand other guys who made low budget films that put just as much time and energy into it, and probably made a better film, and saw and got no money. So this is not about getting rich. This is just about being able to afford to remain an independent filmmaker. I think it's really it's really great that you've kind of you know raised that uh, point because I think many filmmakers, independent filmmakers, uh, kind of they just see the, they just see a goal you know with a, a contract with a you know a company to put their film out and they think that's you know that's it they're going to be set um, you know onto the next project but clearly you know the way the industry's changed that just isn't isn't the case anymore. And I mean you know and it's not like most filmmakers are you know you know it's, we're not. You know, uh, uh, Brian Singer getting uh, twenty million dollars to direct X Men. You know, and then you know another two million to direct the season of the first episode of the season premiere episode of House. You know, they spend you know the three weeks direct. You know, a lot of directors will get will do a dip into television or cable, and God bless them. I, I would take that job too. But you know, you, you get you direct an hour of television. You know, you spend four weeks of your life on it. And You know, 
know, and then what happens is you have that money coming in, so you buy the big house, you, 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 get, you buy, you know, the two cars, you marry the person who, you know, sucks money out of you, and then when suddenly now that the market has changed, these people don't know what to, they, they just, they don't know what to do because, you know, they keep, for their, their, you know, if I say I'm low on money, that means I'm wondering how I'm going to pay the rent. When they say they're low on money, that means, oh, who do I get rid of? The gardener, the maid, the cook, or the, 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 the pool man, you know? Yeah. And, and, and they can't adapt. And then they're so used to making movies that where they just keep throwing money at it, you give them a, a Canon HD and a three-man crew and tell them to go make something in 10 days, they don't know what to do. So who really are the, the true artists and the true filmmakers, the guys who have a hundred days to make a movie and have unlimited budget and can shoot something from every angle and spend a year editing and re-edit and reshoot, and there's always that safety net underneath them, or the filmmaker who's told you have ten days, no reshoots, you know, no over schedule, over budget, and you got to tell this story in ten days or you're fired. I really think that you know hunger. And, you know, uh, uh, a monochrome of poverty, so to speak, <laughs> metaphorically, makes better artists. Because when you're comfortable, you get lazy. And then you get movies like, you know, The Three, The Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Fans. <laughs> <laughs> so where, where do you see movie distribution in, like, the next five or ten years? I, I don't even know if I do. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, I look at the music industry. I mean, the music labels are practically non-existent. I think that, uh, you know, what happened to the music industry? It's almost like people give away their music so they can make money off of touring and merchandising and licensing their songs to, you know, cell phone signals. And what, what you know, I think that we're getting to the point. And now, you know, it, 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 it's... Uh, when you have plasma TVs and surround sound and 3D in your own home, it's, you know, it's going to take something really special to get the average Joe out to the theater. Um, I mean, my, this was so shocking to me. My friend Pete Chink, who wrote the movie Legion and edited Detroit's Rock City, he's a, a professor at a film college here that will remain nameless in L.A. And editing. And, you know, he had his first class last week. And... You know, he, these are kids now. These aren't just the average kids. These are kids who are in film school. And he, you know, how many of you know who Coppola is? Like nobody raised their hand. Whoever heard of Martin Scorsese? No one raised their hand. How many times do you guys go to the movies a month? Oh, maybe once or twice. Yeah. These are film students. So the bottom line is, you know, people. The, Unless it's that big, epic, 3D, giant screen, IMAX, or Skyfall, you know, the smaller, you know, and, and, and you know, with driving now, you know, practically a, a dinosaur, and video stores a dinosaur, most people are content to watch movies. It shocks me on, you know, uh, their Blackberry or their laptop or their iPad. You know, for me, movies were made to be seen on a giant screen with surround sound with a large audience. But, you know, movies, the people seem to just like watching them on a little tat, little something, that, you know, an 8x10 uh, iPad while they're, you know, listening to music on their iPod. Uh, or oh, that's even obsolete. I'm sorry. They're listening to Spotify on, you know, on the, coming out of the computer. And they're not paying them for Spotify. And, you know, and, and they're, I mean, I really don't know. I think that hopefully they'll always, I, the, the, the pendulum will swing so far that people are just so tired of the same old shit and they're going to support indie musicians and indie filmmakers. But I think you're going to see it getting to the point where the only films that are distributed are those big blockbusters. And, you know, you're, you're, it's going to be more, you know, like like uh, indie bands, indie filmmakers. Like that. And, and if you're good and if you can, you know, not have high overhead for your lifestyle and, uh, and really are doing it for the joy of making a movie and not because you just want to become stupid rich... You know, you'll, I think everyone, I think will be okay, but it's definitely a shifting landscape and you have to, you know, it's adapt or die. It really is. It's adapt or die. Yeah. I, th I hope so. Cause I mean, I, I was, you know, trying to think 
you know how i would answer that question myself earlier um as you know i've sort of dabbled in the industry for the last couple of years and i couldn't i, I mean it's kind of scary how uncertain uh the future is you know with the industry um in terms of distribution because you know it could either go one way or the other really magazine was that when I was a kid that even during the depression when people were on food front somehow people managed to come up with a nickel to go see King Kong and make it the blockbuster it was because you know, one of the greatest things when, when things are shitty movies and music and you know it just takes our mind off of things for a while and you know and either in horror you know when the world is so horrifying on the outside be able to go into a movie theater or you know turn off turn off your mind and watch something on an iPod or whatever your iPad. We face the horrors and, and safely and get a catharsis that you know an exorcism, so to speak. That for at least that moment or that day, we feel better until the next headline hits us about global warming or Libya or whatever. And that's life, man. And, you know, enjoy those little moments and, you know, whether it's a Disney film or, 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 or Hostel that, that takes your mind away, God bless, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, movies are, are escapism. Uh, it's what it all comes down to, really. And, you know, there's 90 minutes or 120 minutes of, of an experience and it just, you know, just turn off everything else and just get sucked into a, you know, a film and the fiction. good I, I you know I, I had a blast you know bloody bloody bible camp you know it, it was such an experience playing sister mary chopper and, you know i mean when i was 14 i saw phantasm for the first time at a grindhouse on 42nd street in new york i fell in love with reggie i thought he was so badass never in a million years did i think i would be acting in a movie with him let alone wearing a nun's habit and falsies and a devil mask <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, and how did you actually well, get involved in that as the uh, trans transvestite killer nun? Reggie called me up. He had seen me on Screen Queens, and he's like, "No, you actually are kind of good actor." And I was like, "Well, I was kind of playing myself." He's like, "Yeah, but you know, how'd you like to play a killer transvestite nun named Sister Mary <laughs> Chopper in a comedy called Bloody Bloody Bible Camp that my friend Vito Tribute was directing?" And I was like. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. Five days, Big Bear, being a, you know, I always wanted to be, you know, a monster like Michael, you know, a, a, a masked monster. Yeah. And uh, I just, the script was so damn funny. It felt like something right out of 1979, you know, Porky's Meet Sleepaway Camp. And, and I went and, you know, sometimes, you know, most, uh, hopefully everything you do, you do it for fun. You know, I know we have to work sometimes to do things we don't like to pay the rent. But, you know, there are times when, you know, sometimes you do something not because there's a paycheck, a big paycheck, or even a paycheck, but it's just fun. That Bloody Bloody Bible Camp is one of those times, and, you know, we had a blast. And, and while I was there, Vito allowed me to sort of take over the Mary Chopper character and write the backstory for for her, him. <laughs> <laughs> and we filmed the I, I, I kind of took off on second unit and, and directed all of the uh, Mary Chopper scenes, and we came up with a backstory and had a big unmasking at the end so yes and it gave me an appreciation of you know guys like Kane Hodder and Ty Taylor Man, Tyler Maine and you know Dick Warlock and all these people who have you know, played these characters I mean they're not just you know they're, they're, they're acting and so much when you're covered in a mask and a heavy costume truly is about your, your, your body movement and your body language and your eyes and I really grew a deep appreciation for, for these performers and, uh, you know, I had a blast doing it. I really did. And, and I've seen film with audiences and, you know, it's definitely a, a beer and pizza movie, you know, and, and, and uh, had it come out in 1978 or 79 or 80, it more than likely would have gotten a theatrical and it probably would have done a decent budget, yeah. you know, a, a, a decent uh, a box office. But it's, it's, 
you know, because ironically the movie costs so little, it's already in profit. It's it's so amazing. You know, between being downloaded on iTunes and downloaded on Amazon.com, we actually did a, a download thing first. Now we're self distributing it, but it's it's being released tomorrow on DVD, already in profit. So I'm very proud of of of, of everyone involved in that film because we, you know. From a business standpoint, it did what it was supposed to do. It made money. Yeah, excellent. So I, I believe you shot that one before uh, I was a teenage werebear. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yeah, actually, you're right. Yes, yes. Uh, we shot Bloody Bloody Bloody. Yeah, it's so funny because that, that, God, yeah, it took that long for Bloody to come out. Because, and that's a good point, uh, Vito shopped it around to distributors and everybody was like, well, we'll give you nothing for it. Yeah. And we'll give you nothing for it. And we'll, we love it, we'll give you nothing for it. So Peter's like, fuck that, I'll put it out myself. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, and, uh, but yeah, it's so funny because we shot Bloody Bloody Bible Camp. And that's how I actually met, you know, some of the actors who were on, in Bloody Bible Camp became, were in Wear Bears, like Chris Raft, the chubby kid who's amazing, and Chris Davisky, who played the Sean Paul Lockhart Wear Bear. He was in Bloody Bloody Bible Camp. And, uh, yeah, they're a kindred spirit, those two films. It's good to see filmmakers kind of standing up to the distributors because I think, you know, like you said, um, these all these companies offering, you know, absolutely nothing for these movies, um, just thinking that people are just going to be, you know, so excited by the fact that they've been offered a, a deal um, and just take it. Um, it's, you know, if enough people sort of stand up to that, then I think, you know, distributors are just going to have to change their tune anyway. Money. I mean, you can't, you know, when they tell me how, you know, this is what happened. This is the bottom line. They put out 10 titles, say they put out five titles a month. One does really well. The others, one, you know, one does shitty, three do okay, two do great. Well, I know what the distributors do. I, you know, it, they've been doing it forever, the studios. They amortize the cost. So they basically... It, you know, it's, so they, they, so I know that money that I should be getting for my movie went to cover the losses of another movie that studio was putting out that month. Yeah. And the other thing, like they, 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 when they have, say they have this, a publicist who is the staff that publicizes every release. Well, they, they, they will put that fee for that publicist against the film that made the most money. So that they don't have to, so that they, because they, they have to make a, a profit. So the thing is that, you know, they do, they make this, because it's, it's, a, it's a sad landscape for the distributors as well. But they find ways of making money through, you know, clever bookkeeping. We, the filmmakers, find ways of making money by actually going out there in the trenches, you know, like traveling salesmen in a way, if you think of it, and, and going from horror convention to horror convention, reading and meeting the fans, and selling copies of our films ourselves. And, you know, and, and, and what's going to happen is, if suddenly, you know, distribute, it's the same thing that happened in the music industry. There's no more labels, because the artists got so fed up with getting butt-fucked that, you know, that they just, they just are going, screw you, I'm going to give my music away to my fans because I'm not making a profit anyway. Look what, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Trent Reznor did this. Um, you know, he said, you know what, I'm not making money from the label anyway, so I'm just going to give the music to the fans, and then they'll let, they'll, then make it, they will come see me in concert because hopefully they appreciate the gift of my music, and that's exactly what happens with Nine Inch Nails. So if, if, this, if, if, if filmmakers start saying, screw you, we, 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 you know, we have the means now, you can make, you can, you know, you have to, we used to not be able to manufacture, you know, menus and DVDs and master, but now, Christ, you know, you, people could do that in their home. You could create professional packaging and, you know, just to give you an idea, there's, there's a place I know in LA that, you, you know, We'll make a DVD for you that has, you know, a, a double-sided insert, a wraparound, and artwork on the DVD itself, and it comes in a plastic case, shrink-wrapped. Costs you a buck seventy-five per copy if you order a hundred. Yeah. So think about it. So like, if you, you know, you you order a hundred, and it costs a hundred and seventy-five dollars, 
you sell them for forty dollars, you sell seven, and you covered the cost, and the other ninety-three are pure profit. Yes. Yeah, uh... So if, if more filmmakers started doing that, and we started having you know independent web, you know film like films, you know film site, independent filmmaker sites. And we started selling our stuff directly to Redbox and directly to Amazon. Distributors are going to have to figure either buy or figure something out. But I think they're going. I think they're all going to go away. I think you're only going to have, you know, the big ones who do, you know, Warner Brothers and stuff like that. But I think the smaller ones, they're just, they're just, you know, going one by one. Going back to um your role of uh, Sister Mary Chopper, do you think that that role gave you more kind of confidence and perhaps perspective when you decided to take the role of uh, coach in Where Bears? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know about that. Uh, it, it was, it was, it, the, the role of coach was not by choice. It was a last minute thing because we had uh, John Homa, who was my co-star at Scream Queens, was going to play it. And, 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 and two days before, he got a big movie gig. And I, I told him, of course, go for, the, go for the big gig. And we didn't have time. And I had just, when we were doing the in, uh, auditions, I would play that part. I would read that part. I did the whole voice. Uh, so it was, it's like, it was a matter of not having any time to find somebody else. And I just figured if I'm going to go for it, I'll just make myself as ridiculous looking as possible. And uh, <laughs> I just threw myself in there and I was like, oh my God, could I look any dorkier? <laughs> Did you think taking roles like that has kind of changed your uh, perhaps directing style? I mean, now that you've sort of been in the shoes of actors, do you think that's kind of changed your... Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I understand, you know... I get it. You know, when I I, 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 I I know it's so tough on actors when they're waiting and waiting and waiting for the lights to be ready. And, you know, when I was there and I was in that heavy costume and I, that mask and I was sweating and, you know, but, I, but the thing was, as I understood why it was taking so long. So I, as an actor, had actually had more of a, a, an understanding of the uh, directors. I, I actually think that actors... <laughs> should try making films so they could, you know, that, that they could understand why sometimes it takes so long in between takes to get things right. But um, my appreciate, what, what definitely came out most out of my experience of playing Sister Mary Chopper was I realized, you know, and Paul, and, you know, Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley and Ace and Peter and Kiss have told me this, and Robert England has told me this, and Kane has told me this, but where the real freedom comes is playing a masked character, whether it's wearing a mask or makeup or grease paint, that does something to you because it truly unleashes things that you didn't know were inside you because you're, you're hidden from the world. And I, I channel things that were so, I watch the movie and I get disturbed because I'm like, where did that come from? And it was interesting because the mask, my dialogue was muffled by the mask. So after every take, I had to take the mask off and redo the dialogue. I could not face the crew. I had to turn my back and do the voice. I, I could not, I had to close my eyes and pretend I was still wearing the mask. I, I could not, I don't even, I don't even think I could do that voice now if you asked me to. I'd have to wear the mask. <laughs> So you don't think you could actually have done that role if it wasn't if it wasn't masked? Not as not as effectively, no. Maybe now I can, but but I I I the mask and the mask gave me a freedom to just be as creepy and and, and, and dark as possible. A barrier. Oh right. A barrier because. Sister Mary Chopper, we came up, we came up with this very sing-songy, childish, creepy voice, like something out of Suspiria, with high pitched and, and going back and forth between being happy and being miserable, and being happy and being, uh, you know, freaky and, and just this bipolar mess, and um, not ha being able to do that without having people being able to see me. 
So are you ever going to play a character who isn't a bit weird? Actually, I did. It's so funny. I, I, I never knew. I mean, I've become a, a, you know, a side job is now being an actor. I, who knew? And Scream Queen, you know, because I was in Chillerama and Bloody Bible Camp. And then Chris Davisky, who uh, was uh, in Bloody and Wear Bears, he's also a director, and he directed this film called Pain is Beautiful, which I don't, I, I, I didn't produce, but he cast me as uh, the lead detective. And that's coming out uh, next first quarter of 2013. And that's another one of those films that's going to be distributed independently. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's a serious film. And I play a detective and it's totally serious. And, uh, you know, I, I was really humbled that he asked me to play it. And uh, I've been asked to be in a couple other. Paul Ward's doing a new film called In the Arms of the Devil. That's very Dennis Wheatley-esque. He's going to be shooting it in Dublin. It's very The Devil Rides Out. And uh, he's asked me to play the leader of the satanic cult. And uh, it's a very serious role. And I, I, I'm enjoying this. I'm really liking this. So a- acting is, is fitting into your uh, filmmaking repertoire then? It's uh, Do you think it's becoming something that you kind of consider yourself as now or, or may do in the future? Well, not put myself in the same category as De Niro, you know, or, or Hoffman or any of that, but I mean, I started out as an actor. I was in all the school plays. I mean, I, I was in every play from kindergarten to senior year, and I was I was always a, a, an entertainer. I was a magician when I was a teenager called The Great Salamini. Uh, I always acted in, in plays, and uh, but I, I didn't think I had what it took. Um, so I decided to be behind the camera. And uh, when I was making my student films, though, I always put myself in them. But when I graduated from film school, I just decided to focus on um, directing. So, you know, I, I, I have a background. It's just that I have tapped into that for 20 years. Yeah. And now that it, I am, I'm, I'm really enjoying it, you know. But do I, I mean, I... I, I do I consider myself an actor? I, 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 no. <laughs> Not quite a, uh, a thespian yet, then. Uh, no, I mean, <laughs> I'm having fun, and, and people seem to think I do a good job, but, you know, uh, I, I, I could play, I mean, I'm good at playing caricatures. I don't know if I could be, we'll see. Uh, uh, we'll see. I, I, I mean, uh, I, I enjoy it, and I'm, I'm up for it, and I would definitely work for it if somebody... Uh, Offered me the, the opportunity. Yeah, that's good to hear. Excellent. Then, Any, anything you'd like to to add about your uh, future projects? Any uh, poet exile? Well, so, um, yeah, it, it's like I, it's interesting because I have this sort of I I I I've built this horror resume, which I you know I I'm so proud, grateful to have been uh, able to do. Uh, and at the same time that I'm doing the sort of self-distribution indie producing, I'm also you know, working on a bigger a bigger film than I've worked on before, and a non-horror film, The Poet in Exile, which I'm writing and directing, and it's based on a book by Ray Manzarek of The Doors, as you know, that imagines what if Jim Morrison didn't die. And, uh, you know, this is going to be a, a bigger movie along the budget of, say, Crazy Heart and The Wrestler, and we've been talking to some amazing actors about participating. Uh, like Richard Gere and Harrison Ford and Kurt Russell, and uh, so we'll, you know, so I'll be doing that. You know, again, the yin and the yang. I, I love it. You know, you got the yin of the uh, sort of prestige project, poet and exile, and then you got the yang of the bloody Bible camps and, the, and the, you know, the cut prints and all that stuff. So I, I, I'm grateful. I really do this because I really, really love being a storyteller. And I love making movies. And, you know, as long as I have access to a camera, I'm going to, whether I just make them for myself and my mom and sister or other people check them out. (laughs) (laughs) That's really cool to see you dabbling in, um, you know, so many different genres. And, uh, you know, like you said, from low budget horror to these these bigger projects, it's uh, really interesting to see. said to me life is not a genre you know like every day some parts of it are comedies you know there's other moments that are horror every now and then it's a thriller sometimes hopefully it's a you know a porno 